Uh, it's my honor today to uh, have this opportunity to uh, present some of our research in my group. So the talk of this, uh, uh, the title of this talk today is 3D computer vision. We're going to talk about some uh, recent advances in uh, biomedicine. Uh, so let me give you uh, uh, some background in the beginning. Um, as we know, we have uh, five senses. Uh, we uh, gather information from the environment through what we see, what we smell, we hear, touch, and taste. It turns out that about 8% of the information we gather from the environment comes from what we see, or in other words, through our vision system. Right. The original motivation of computer vision um, is try to use computers, including the hardware, software, to mimic the brains to capture, process, and understand the information, especially the visual information. All right. So um, computer vision uh, started in 2D because um, what we see with one eye is basically 2D images. All right. This is also true for most imaging devices all right, now we give you 2D images. Of course, 2D images give you a lot of Im information which are important in many applications. For example, in uh, identification of a person uh, through his or her fingerprints or face images, right? We have 2D images for these purposes. All right, so um, as we uh, mentioned earlier, we use 2D images for lots of applications, including the identification of a person with his or her fingerprint or the face images. But the lack of depth information in 2D images makes it impossible for many applications like 3D quantification, 3D visualization, or 3D animations. Right. So in order to have um, the depth information, we can use two eyes, or at least two eyes, or with two lens in the <coughs> camera systems to capture the depth information or to perceive the third dimension of the object. So um, with multiple uh, views, it's possible to reconstruct three models from different views of the objects. Then we have a two, object, uh, two problems in, this, uh, in our group to uh, uh, you know, uh, explore. One is to reconstruct 3D models from multiple images, multiple 2D images. Another question we are interested in is to analyze the 3D models which we reconstruct from 2D data set. Right. So in, the, in our group, we do have um, a number of you know, projects going on. So we have uh, the name of our uh, lab is uh, Biomedical Modeling and Visualization Lab. Uh, we basically take 2D images as input. The images can be 2D raw data, can be 3D volume images reconstructed from 2D images. All right. Then what we do is to generate 3D models that can be used for quantification, your simulation, and so on and so forth. All right. Related to our work are three subjects or three courses we are teaching in, this, uh, in our department, computer science department. One is uh, image processing. Second one is uh, scientific computing. The third is uh, computer graphics. So if you're interested in those topics, you're feel free to uh, talk, to me, uh, talk to me. Now, um, I'm going to start with the first question we um, uh, mentioned earlier. How do we reconstruct 3D models from 2D images? Right. We do have a two sub-problems here, depending on what we want to do in the problem uh, domain. We can do surface reconstruction. We can do volumetric reconstruction. Right. So with surface re reconstruction, we only see the surface detail, e either the geometry or the texture on the surface. We cannot see the internal structures through the surface reconstruction techniques. Another one is a volumetric recon reconstruction. We can see through the surface, see the internal structures of the object. Right. So um, this, of course, depends on what we really want in the in different applications, and also this depends on what Im imaging grids we are using for those different problems. So basically, imaging grids can be reflective for surface reconstruction, can be transmissive for internal structures or volumetric recon reconstruction. Right. With surface with uh, reflective rays, we can see the surface details or surface shape, which are reflected on the surface of the object, 
Right. For example, in uh, this picture, we have about 45 images of the flower from different views. We can re reconstruct the 3D surface shape of the flower from those different views. Right. So this is uh, um, only surface reconstruction because the visible light is reflected on the surface of the flower before the reach our eyes. Right. So they cannot really penetrate into the surface of this object. So that's the reflective ray based approach for surface reconstructing. Now in order to see the internal structures, we do have to consider something different, which is a transmissive rays. Right. So transmissive rays, for example, the X-ray or gamma rays can penetrate into the skin of our body to see the internal structures, right, like the bone structures or some other tissues. Okay. So using the transmissive rays, we can see through the, uh, the surface and then see some internal structures with different you know, intensities or with different uh, shapes or geometries. Okay. So this is another problem based on the transmissive rays for 3D volumetric reconstruction. So we start from, uh, I will start from the first problem, how we can see uh, or how we can compute the surface geometry by using multiple views of the 2D images. Right. I will start with this uh, simple example. So basically what we do is um, to detect the feature points in two of those images, because we have to have uh, at least uh, two images to do the 3D re reconstruction. Okay. So first we detect the feature points in both images. Then we find out the correspondence between the feature points in those images. So um, then we can do the back projection because each point in one view gives you one ray starting from the camera to the, uh, to the space. This one gives you another view or another ray. Those two rays will meet somewhere in the 3D space and that intersecting point is your 3D coordinates of this feature point. Okay? So if you have a sufficient number of corresponding points in those two images, you can come up with uh, point clouds or a number of points in 3D space. Right. Then we can uh, reconstruct 3D surface model from those point clouds. So that's the basic idea of the multi-view reconstructing from multiple images. Okay. So we have been using this idea or this technique for uh, scanning electron microscope uh, reconstruction. This is a, a very simple picture. Shows the structure of SEM. So we have um, the electron source that goes from top to bottom. We have the stage that will hold the biological sample. The stage can rotate um, you know, by some degrees from one to the next uh, views. We have uh, two types of uh, detectors. One is BSE. BSE means uh, backscattered electron detectors. The other is a SU detector, which is a secondary de uh, electron uh, detectors. Okay. Normally we use a SU detector for a 3D geometry because this one is better suited for geometry information on the surface or on the biological samples. Okay. And those images give you um, some <coughs> examples of SEM with two views. For example, this one here, we have uh, two views from different uh, angles. Normally the angles between two views is from seven to 10 degrees. We cannot to have a two large gap between views or two small gaps. Otherwise we have some accuracy issue with the 3D reconstruction. All right. So we have a couple of other examples. This one is uh, the ash particle in the air, right? It's a very tiny size, but we're gonna see some 3D models for these examples later. So the problem here is to take a number of 2D images as input. Again, those 2D images are taken from different views. The angle is uh, between seven to 10 degrees, right, between each two of those. Then uh, our goal is to reconstruct 3D models from those different views for the, uh, of the 2D images, okay. Here's um, one example. Uh, this is um, 3D models, which is, uh, computed from two views, only two views of the 2D pictures, right, from two views. Uh, this is an input, those two Im images are input, okay. Uh, then we can simply compute the 3D models or 3D details of the object from those two views. This is what we call the multi-view 
reconstruction for the surface. Again, this is only for surface reconstruction. And the approach we are taking uh, is um, called sparse dense approach uh, because uh, of the time I won't give you too much detail about the algorithm. But I'll quickly go over the steps we have for this uh, approach. The first step for this approach is to um, detect some sparse feature points in those uh, two images. Right. We use um, SIFT SIFT, which is Scale Invariant Feature Transform, which is a very fo uh, popular technique for feature detection in imaging data. Okay. So we use SIFT to detect the features in uh, each one of those two images. Then we use a RANSAC to build up the correspondence between the feature points in those two images. Uh, next, we estimate the matrix that will transform one image to the other so that those two images will be rectified. Because when you take the images, the images may be rotated arbitrarily. Okay. So in order to have a better accuracy, we have to rectify those two images so they have the, they have the same orientation in the 3D space. Okay. So that's a rectification step for this algorithm. Then we estimate the disparity. Disparity is kind of the distance between two corresponding points in the two images. Right? This disparity will tell you some information about the depths, as we're going to see in the next few slides. So this is a very important step in this algorithm. Um, what we do here is to minimize the similar, the, uh, minimize the, the difference of the intensities between two corresponding points in, the, in those two images. By, mi uh, by mi minimizing the intensity difference, we can find out the best disparity for each pair of the feature points in the, in the images. Okay? So um, in order to have um, a better um, your, um, robustness for the, to the noise, we have, uh, we, we have introduced the weighting window in this algorithm. So instead of simply computing the difference between two images, we added the uh, exponential function into this, in, into this formula. So we have a much more robust algorithm to the noise in the image. Now the next step is to, um, or in addition to the, um, to the weight we added into the formula, we also use a patch match technique to uh, fix the problem. This problem is what we call the staircase problem because uh, you, um, when we take the picture of the 3D object, we simply have the, some slices from, from nearest to the, to the farthest of the, of the object relative to the camera. Okay. So those different slices will give you the staircase artifact. Okay. So this artifact can be fixed by using this uh, patch match technique. Right. We're going to see some uh, examples later. Now once you have the disparity, we can um, uh, first check the consistency. Because when you compute the disparity, we do the disparity calculation for the left image by using the right image. In the meantime, we also have to, to do the disparity estimation by using the left image for the right image. So those two disparity maps have to be consistent to each other. Okay. So that's the, uh, what we do in this step, the consistency checking between those two disparity maps. Once we do the, this one, then we compute the depth or the height information of the object. That's the third dimension of the object by using the disparity map, where D is what we computed from the previous steps. That's the disparity map. P is a pixel size. That's a physical size for each pixel in the image. Right? The theta is the angle between those two views. Right? You could have a 7 degree, 10 degree, and so on and so forth. Right? So that would be the degree for between the two views. So you can see the uh, connection or conversion from P uh, from D to H, from disparity to the height of the image. So that will give you the third dimension or the depth information of the 3D object. Right? This one gave you um, a 3D uh, animation of the example we have seen earlier. We have uh, two images as input. This is um, the SEN image of the ash particle. We can see the 3D models, right? Uh, in the first approach we are taking here, we can see some artifact, the staircase artifact in the depth information, right? 
So you can see the, those artifacts. Then we switch to the patch mesh technique. We can see much smoother you, um, uh, 3D models on the surface of this uh, ash particle. Okay, we're use, using just two views, 2D, uh, two views of the, of the object. We can create our very nice uh, 3D models. We have been uh, working with our college in uh, our school, um, uh, Pradeep, trying to use this technique to analyze the surface roughness of the aluminum uh, materials. So this is uh, one of the applications we have tried um, you know, with the technique we have developed so far. Um, now the technique we have seen so far is what we call the passive reconstruction technique. It's passive because we simply take whatever images we have. We cannot really deal with you know, something different, something uh, additional information we don't have. Okay. This technique heavily depends on the feature detection, heavily depends on the correspondence between the feature of the two images. Okay. If you have um, an image in a very dark environment, you don't have much information about the features. right? Or if you have an image in a very bright environment, again, the features will disappear, or you don't see much features in the images. So those cases will render this technique, passive technique, you, um, as a problem. Okay. So um, in order to fix that problem, we have another technique called active reconstruction technique. By active, we mean we can use not just a camera, we also use a projector to assist this process. Okay. So camera will take the picture of the surface, you are re reflective ray on the surface. We also have a projector that will cast some specially designed patterns on the surface. Okay. So you can see uh, the patterns we have here is just a number of colored you are line structures. Right? Ideally, if you have a flat surface, those line structures will still be in parallel to each other. Okay. But if you have a curved surface, those patterns will become curved. Okay. So according to how the curves will be uh, displayed in the image, we can estimate the depths. So that's the idea of this uh, active approach. With this active approach, we can achieve better accuracy. Right? We can also um, um, reduce the dependency of the approach to the image quality in the input. Okay? So um, we have been um, seeing some examples or some applications in dental uh, industry. People have been using uh, active uh, 3D scanning technique for model scanning and also for intraoral scanning. This one is to scan the model of the teeth. Right? This scanner, 3D scanner is like a 3D printer, you know, this size. Right? You can put the 3D models in, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, equipment then the, there's a visible light, uh, lighting source on the top. You can rotate the platform here to uh, take the pictures of the, of the object from different views. Then you can stitch different 3D depth information together to form the final complete 3D models. Okay. So that's the model scanning. This one is more challenging because uh, you have a very different environment in the mouth. Right? You have uh, uh, were much worse image quality. You also have to do this uh, you are in a much higher speed because you have so many slices to process, so many frames to process. This is like a video. Okay? So we have been working with uh, some of our collaborators to develop some algorithms for inter-order scanning. This video here shows um, our algorithm to stitch different views um, together into a 3D models. So you can say one patch in green is just one frame we take from the inter-order scanner. Uh, those are given as 3D point clouds, so that means we have a lot of points in each frame. We are trying to stitch together into a 3D models. So in this process, it's very critical to have a correct correspondence between each one of the, each uh, one pair of the of the adjacent frames. Okay. Uh, in this video or in this example, we have about 500 frames. Each frame contains about 30K, 30,000 
points in order to reduce the uh, number of points for speed accuracy and so on and so forth we uh, reduce the number of points in each frame to uh, 3,000 or 3K. Okay. But still, we have about 1.5 million points in this final 3D model. Okay. So you can see we have uh, very decent accuracy in the final uh, 3D uh, reconstructed model. This uh, slide shows you some analysis for the accuracy. We have um, the color map. The red color means a uh, higher error. Um, your green color means uh, lower error. We use um, the model scanner, model-based 3D scanner as a ground source for this inter-owner scanner. Okay. So we do the comparison. We first register those two models. Then we calculate the distance between the two models. Okay. So that's uh, how we do the error analysis for this, uh, uh, for this uh, study. Now you can see um, we do have um, average error distance which is about um, eight uh, micron. Eight micron is a very high accuracy for dental your applications, right? Uh, the positive uh, average distance is, uh, is about 30 micron. The negative uh, average distance is about 25 micron. So all those numbers are good enough for most of the dental applications, right? So um, with the 3D models, reconstructed from the active your, uh, 3D scanning technique, we can do a lot of different applications in dental or in dentistry. For example, you can do implant design based on the 3D model. Of course, in order to do this uh, implant design, we have to also incorporate the CT of the patient to, the, you know, to design the, the, the uh, implant. Uh, uh, so this is... Um, the first one. We can also do the dental restoration based on what you recovered from the patient. We can also do the uh, teeth alignment right, for, uh, for the patient based on the 3D models you have. Okay, so you can do different your know, applications based on the 3D models. But 3D model is not sufficient. As I said, if you want to do implant design, we cannot just rely on the 3D models. We have to consider the CT, right, internal structures. So that's what I want to talk about in the next you know, um, few slides. We have surface reconstruction. We also have a volumetric reconstruction, which is critical in many areas. Okay. So um, the internal structure determination is, um, has been on the market for many years because CT, MRI, lots of imaging, medical imaging devices are based on this concept. Right? The basic idea for CT is to take the projecting data from different views and try to use some mathematics uh, techniques to reconstruct the 3D volumes from those 2D projecting data. Okay. So the theory has been very mature in the, in the past you know, decades, but um, we have been uh, using similar techniques for a number of different areas. Uh, so, for example, we have been uh, uh, thinking about the medical imaging for tissue or organ, organ scale. We have been working with our collaborators for right microscope imaging at the micrometer uh, scale. We also work with uh, EM, which means uh, electron microscope uh, imaging or tomography at the nanometer scale. We have been using cryo EM. Cryo EM means a very low temperature for the electron microscope imaging technique for the sub nanometer scales. Um, now, if you go further, you can go to the crystal structures using X-ray. X-ray crystal structures now can give you atomic resolution. Okay. So, um, because of the time, I will only give you a very brief introduction to this cryo EM. Right. How we can use uh, imaging or 3D reconstruction for cryo EM volumetric reconstruction. So um, again, the concept is very similar to the medical CT. We use uh, multiple views right, to reconstruct 3D volumes. But the, in the uh, cryo-EM community, 
the signal to noise ratio is very, very low compared to the medical imaging uh, image, uh, devices. Okay. So if you look at this, uh, those particles in the background, you know, this is a very, I mean, this has a very low quality right, compared to, let's, let's say, the brain data or the heart data we take from the CT machines. Okay. So the, in order to achieve the sub nanometer or even the atomic resolution, we have to consider some kind of averaging technique because averaging can reduce the noise, right? If you have a lot of noise, the only way you can do is to use a huge amount of data to reduce the noise by averaging those data together, okay? So we're using this technique by averaging thousands of or ten thousand thousand of particles together to reduce the uh, noise or to increase the signal to noise ratio, okay? So that's why we call the single particle technique. This has been a very powerful technique for uh, your uh, molecular structure de uh, determination. Uh, this pipeline shows you, um, you know, how we start from the very beginning. Of course, we don't do the experiments right, in our group. We only do the calculation or the uh, software part of this uh, pipeline. So starting from the biochemistry um, preparation, crowd EM sample preparation, doing the 2D imaging, uh, data connection, 3D uh, image processing to increase the quality of the image, then 3D reconstruction, do some structure analysis. Okay. So our work is uh, basically the data connection here. How do we detect the particles in the imaging data? How do we do the 3D reconstruction? How do we do the structure analysis in this process? Okay. Um, this, um, this technique has been uh, very powerful in recent years, so it's not impossible now to achieve almost atomic resolution, right? You can achieve almost like two angstroms or three angstroms or even beyond that one by using this cryo-EM technique. And this is why the Nobel Prize in chemistry was awarded to three scientists last year for developing cryo-EM for the high resolution structure deter deter uh, determination of biomolecules in solutions. So that's a very important uh, milestone for uh, structure, 3D structure determination in uh, biology or biochemistry. All right. So um, this will be the first question we have um, raised earlier. How do we do 3D reconstruction from 2D imaging data? Okay. Now the next question is um, how do we analyze the 3D uh, models or 3D imaging uh, 3D uh, imaging vol volumes, okay? So, um, okay, we have uh, two um, types of uh, um, techniques. One is uh, what we call the knowledge-based. The other is uh, data-driven. Data-driven is probably um, you know, something you have heard about. This is uh, like machine learning or deep learning. You simply use huge, um, uh, huge amount of data to train the system. Then you can use the train system to do the work for you. Okay, so that's data driven. The knowledge driven is more like a traditional method. You have some understanding of the system, the problem, then you design some algorithm to do the work for you. Okay, so both are you know, powerful in terms of uh, uh, you know, um, different uh, problems or different understanding of the problems. Okay, so um, in the following slides, I will give you a quick summary of those two problems how we can use um, your knowledge-based method and data-driven method to do 3D analysis, especially for 3D segmentation of the models or 3D uh, segmentation of the imaging volumes. So the first one is, um, so first of all, the segmentation is a very hard problem, traditionally, right? Given the image, can you quickly, accurately find out the features or the region of the features or the boundary of the features, okay? This is a, a very hard problem before we actually started to use deep learning, right? So we have been uh, using level set method. This one has been considered as uh, the best approach for segmentation before deep learning has been used in the, in the community, okay? So we use level set method to detect the heart. We have a left ventricle, right ventricle in this uh, heart of the mouse, okay? We can segment two regions from someone to left and right ventricles in those uh, different slices of the 3D volumes, right? 
So then you can construct the 3D models from those segmented contours on each slice. Okay. Then this is um, a 3D models of different um, time steps. Uh, you can see um, how the shape or size of the heart is changing over time. Again, this is uh, possible because of the segmentation of the 3D volumes. Okay. Um, I don't think I can play this video because it's not available on this computer. So let me, all right, so that's, uh, so in this video, I was trying to show the segmentation of some of the important uh, structures like the blood vessels, the spine structures, or the kidney and so on and so forth, right? So this has been based on the level set method. You can segment some important features from the imaging volumes. But this is still the knowledge-based method, right? When you segment, for example, the heart right, of the mouse, you assume that the feature has higher intensity, higher intensity values than the background or some other features, okay? So that's the knowledge you are using for this segmentation, right? You have certain understanding of the problem you have, right? In this case, it's simply the intensities. Now, in some other cases, you may use, uh, for example, the symmetry. Remember cryo-EM I mentioned earlier? We can use cryo-EM to reconstruct very high resolution of the viruses or some other macromolecular structures. Okay. This is um, the 3D reconstructed you know, um, uh, structure map for Reisdorf virus. Okay. We have a number of proteins on the capsid of this uh, virus. The first stage is to segment the capsid containing a number of proteins in this 3D map. Right, so that's the first stage uh, to segment. In this uh, stage, we are using the radiance information because we know the capsid is uh, somewhere um, from the center of the virus. Okay, so that's the information we're using, or that's the knowledge we're using. Okay, still the knowledge-based method. Then we uh, detect the symmetry of this uh, virus, right, because symmetry is uh, another information we're using or another knowledge we're using for uh, structure analysis. Okay. Once you detect the symmetry, we can segment the individual trimer. Trimer is a kind of a, uh, a structure with three proteins together. Okay. So trimer segmentation for this uh, whole map of the virus. Then we can segment individual trimers. We can average those trimers together to form this uh, you know, uh, um, 3D map with uh, less noise in the, in the density map. Then we can further segment individual protein. We call this as monomer, monomer protein. Okay. Okay, we're using the same information. Okay. So you can say this whole process is based on some knowledge, some understanding of the map. Right? Without the knowledge, it's very hard to accurately segment the features. Right? So we call this as knowledge-based method. So in order to do this, you have to have a deep understanding of the problems you have. So that's why when you consider knowledge-based method, you have to do lots of studies for the problems. Otherwise, you, your algorithm may not be working properly for those problems. Okay. So I have another video here, but again, I don't think it's uh, wrongly. Okay. So um, now going to the next type of algorithm. Knowledge-based method depends on how you understand the problems. Okay? If you don't have a good understanding of the problem, but fortunately you have a huge amount, amount of data available, then you can switch to the data-driven <coughs> approach. Okay? For data-driven approach, you normally have to construct a neural network. Right? For example, this one here gives you a number of layers. Right? from the input to the output, okay? So this one can give you uh, some structure. You design the structure, but the structure are normally regular. You can use some structures that other people are using, okay? Then use your own data to train the network, okay? So this process is uh, purely depends on how much data you have and how uh, much understanding you have on the data, okay? Because you have to label the data before you can train the system, right? So in this example here, we have um, trained this uh, neural network to 
detect where the each individual teeth is in the image, right? We can detect the upper teeth, lower teeth, and also we can lo locate each one of the teeth in the image. Um, then we can segment the boundary, the accurate boundaries of each teeth. Okay, then this uh, is what we call the instant segmentation of the object by using this uh, what we call the CNN based method. CNN is a convolutional neural network, which is a very popular uh, network used for image processing. We use a similar uh, neural network to segment the uh, tubes in the in the CT of the head. Okay, uh, under this the the lower teeth we have uh, this uh, tube. We call this as a mandibular uh, canal extraction. Okay, so we try to extract those uh, those two uh, tubes from the CT data. What we do here is um, we have to. So basically, what we do is to convert the three D problem. This is the three D data. Okay. We can convert the 3D problem into a 2D problem by cutting through the 3D data into a number of 2D slices. But this cutting direction is based on the arc of the teeth. Okay, we cut through the perpendicular direction of the arc. Okay. Then we generate a number of 2D images. We have about 128 images for one host data set. Then we do the segmentation or feature detection individually on each image. Once you have the results from each Im image or slice, you can reconstruct 3D tube from the from all those uh, your detection of individual slices. This one is another area. We use um, uh, the data driven approach to segment the intervertebral disks. Right? Um, you can see uh, we have a uh, two uh, models here. One is the, the cornered model, that's a labeled model. So those are the manually segmented models by expert. Okay. We also have the predicted models in a mesh, like this one, or this a white corner. You know, that gives you the predicted results. So those are the results predicted by our own uh, trained network. Okay. So in most cases, they match very well to each other. You can even see the details if you zoom in those three um, disks here, you can see uh, some you know, more details between the two models. Or you can uh, see the um, your uh, correspondence between the two results in number of slices in 2D. Okay. So you can see the red corner is our prediction. The yellow corner is the uh, labeled data. The match very well. Okay. Uh, we also apply, remember the CNN, the neural network, or deep learning network has been used extensively for imaging data because images are regular. You have a X, Y, or X, Y, Z, pixels or voxels, regularly defined in three axes. Okay. That's very uh, suitable for neural network, especially for CNN network. Okay. What if you have a 3D model? Because 3D model is given by a number of triangles. We call 3D models in triangle formula as unstructured model. Unstructured means uh, we don't have a regular mesh, we don't have a regular grid, right? It's uh, arbitrary in the 3D model or in the 3D space. Okay. Now in this case, it's uh, harder, it's more challenging, but um, what, we, what we do here is to convert the 3D model segmentation into a 2D image segmentation problem. So we can simply use a graphics technique to take some virtual pictures of the 3D model from different views, right? We can place a virtual camera somewhere in the surrounding the 3D model. Then we take pictures, and those pictures will give you 2D images. Then we run the CNN technique we mentioned earlier for 2D image segmentation. Then we can reconstruct 3D models, right, uh, by going back to the 3D space. Okay, so that's what we do in this uh, uh, in this uh, scenario. So first, um, what we do is to segment the teeth from the uh, rest of the model. Right, so that's the uh, first one. Then we go uh, further to segment indi individual teeth by using different colors. Okay. So this is uh, again using the idea we mentioned earlier. So we have uh, converted 3D models into a number of 2D images. Then we do the 2D image segmentation, then going back to 3D models to kind of uh, uh, stitch together the results. 
All right, so that's uh, basically what we have for today's uh, uh, talk. Here's a quick summary for uh, this talk. We have discussed uh, two problems. The first one is uh, 3D reconstruction. We have uh, two techniques or two different scenarios. One is for surface reconstruction. We can simply have a 3D surface geometry by using reflective rays, right? because rays will be reflected on the surface. So you cannot see through the surface to see the internal structures. Okay. We have active method. This is um, actually the uh, method that most 3D scanners are using on the market. Okay. We also have a passive method. Passive method gives you less accuracy, but this is uh, more accessible because you can simply take pictures of the object then do the 3D reconstruction. You don't have to have a 3D scanner equipment. right? So that's more accessible, but gives you less accuracy. We call this as a multi-view technique. Then uh, we also talk about the volumetric or volume reconstruction based on the CT concept or CT theory. Okay. We have a computed tomography used by medical CT or electron microscope or electron uh, tomography. Okay. We also uh, give you a quick summary of the single particle method, which is also called cryo-EM technique. So that's the first problem we have. Then the second problem is um, 3D analysis, or per in particular, we talk about 3D segmentation of the, of the models or 3D segmentation of the uh, volumes. Okay. We have a knowledge-based method. We have a data-driven method. But how do you choose between the two? As I said, if you have a deep understanding of the problem, but you don't have uh, much data to use, then try the knowledge-based method. If you have um, lots of data to use, and you have the label for the data, um, but you don't have uh, much knowledge about the problem, then try the data-driven method. Okay. If you have uh, both, both data and knowledge, then try learning from the knowledge. Because if you combine knowledge with data, you should have a better your, uh, your model for the uh, data analysis. Now, what if you don't have a data, you don't have knowledge? Okay. You can, we always have the robots, right? So um, I believe uh, if AI is today, then robotics should be tomorrow, okay? But tomorrow is built upon today, right? Because uh, AI is a brain of robots. So we have to first you make AI work well before we can really have uh, working robots. Okay, so that's all for this talk. Thank you very much. or do you also need to know what those relative angles were? Um, if you know the angle, it's going to be uh, easier for the problem. But the reconstruction itself doesn't require the angle information. It's all about the two images. Because once you know the features and the correspondence between the features, you can estimate the angle. You can estimate the transformation from one to the other. Okay, so that's actually given. But you have to make sure the correspondence is accurate. Otherwise, the transformation may give you some problems. But yes, you don't have to need use any other information. Okay. Any other question? Sure. There's one. Thank you. Uh, so when we, uh, when you showed that to reconstruct uh, the teeth, uh, uh, it was just some green area that gradually getting the different part of the entire uh, teeth that we had. Mm -hmm. So how uh, you track the, I mean, every time you, you take some picture and then you add up uh, together, right? Yes. Uh, so how the, it, it knows that where it is uh, looking for, or I mean, is there the any? Correspondence, you mean? Uh, yeah. The correspondence between the two frames? Yes. OK. So this is, um, uh, depends on the features you have on each frame. If you have just a two flat you know, patch, it's impossible to match those two accurately. 
So you are using some curvature inf information. So that means each frame must give you some curvature. Then you use the curvature information to match those two together, right? So if otherwise you really cannot have uh, accurate registration between two frames you, if you don't have that information, the features. The yep. user could change even the, in any direction that it wants. Uh, I mean, the, the camera. Uh, no, you or have it, to it make should... sure uh, two frames overlap for about at least 70%. Mm -hmm. If you only have, a, let's say, 30% overlap between two frames, again, the accuracy may be very low. Mm -hmm. You may have some problems with that. So that's why when you take the uh, videos by using the inter-order scanner, you have to make sure you move slowly. If you move too fast, then the overlap will be very minimal. Then you have some problems with the stitching process. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, just for grins, have you guys tried using uh, backscatter electron imaging? And you're uh, we, applying it to that to get subsurface information? I don't think we have tried that. But uh, since the, those images coming from the uh, EM lab in the biology department, uh, we are working with uh, you know, a professor there. So, But what we have been using so far is only the SE, SE okay. detector. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. So I have I have one question actually because mm -hmm. I personally I have a dental implant. Mm -hmm. So when, when I saw your example, I was oh okay. So um, I wonder uh, if any of those um, algorithms and uh, have generated any real-world application or commercially available um, This project is a collaboration with uh, a group in China. So uh -huh. they are doing something in that direction. But uh, for our case, we only focus on the algorithm. Yeah, like the stitching of two frames or different few frames. Yeah, those are our focus. Yeah. Okay. okay, so uh, regarding the segmentation of the teeth, uh, how people um, uh, get the ground truth information? Um, by drawing on the 3D model. Oh, so we ask manually. the dentist, we ask dentist to draw the curves you know, on the, by using some, some software. So we use that as a labeling or as a, the ground truth for the training. I see, yeah. I see. So for labeling, I think that's the probably uh, you know, the common case. You always ask expert to provide the labeling data for you. Mm. Yeah. As well as, uh, you know, because uh, the uh, accuracy of the network depends on how accurate the label data is. Uh, if you have some problems with the labeling, then you may have some you know, problems with the network too. I yeah. see. So we, yeah, we ask dentists to draw this for us. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much.